Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those folks who are in Europe and the UK and in other parts of the world. We are absolutely thrilled to invite you to Avis and Young's uh, webinar, Ready, Reset, Go. Our uh, goal today is to give you the launch of the new year, everything you need to know about workplace, office, investment, and what's, you know, what's taking place around the globe. Just as a reminder, all of the attendees are on mute. Our session is being recorded. So as we go through the presentations and the panel discussions, please use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen and we'll pick those up. So when we get to the Q&A at the end of this session, we'll be able to respond accordingly for everybody. So I can't tell you how excited we are about today's webinar. Next slide, please. For, for our agenda for today, action packed, totally, again, so that you can learn or know everything that, that is taking place in workplace and office around the world. The first format for our panel is to have a conversation about the war for talent, workplace, and current office market dynamics. Anna Scali, our director of workplace from the UK, will speak to the war for talent trends, Rick Yubera, who leads our workplace consulting in the US, will talk about next steps and how to actually you know, unpack the puzzle. And Nick Axford, who's our global head of insight, will talk about market dynamics around the globe. Following the initial presentations, we're having a riveting panel conversation uh, with uh, both a combination of occupiers and investors, because we think it's really that balance and that combination that's really important. Uh, first, Tony Rossi, who's president of Real Estate and Infrastructure Ontario, a large public sector organization with uh, lots of millions of square feet in space, followed by Jonathan Pierce, executive vice president for leasing and development of North America for Ivanhoe, Cambridge, along with Richard Moore, who's global head of the PMO for Cisco around workplace, and Rosalie McNano Asti, who's the vice president of corporate real estate at Endeavor. So action pack, you won't be bored, lots of great topics. I'm gonna to start setting the stage. Let's go to the first slide there, please, Brittany, over to the next one as well. And just share with you what's going on in workplace around the world. So let's start, you know, lockdown, where we actually started this whole conversation almost two years ago or, you know, 22 months ago. COVID and the, and the pandemic has changed absolutely everything about how we think about workplace. Literally, it's the largest change management activity globally. It's like somebody threw the cards up in the air and said, where are they going to land? And so what we've learned as organizations and as people is that we know that we can work anywhere, anytime, any place. And it's not about what you do or watching you do it. It's about um, it starts about what you do is not where you do it. And so for um, both our employees and our businesses are saying, is the office dead? Absolutely not. But really, what is the role of the workplace? And what, what do I want to return to work for? Next slide. So when you think about remote work and how it's been playing out during the pandemic, Gallup has done all of this work and found that profitability has gone up by 21%, sales have gone up, productivity has gone up, absenteeism has gone down because if I have a cold, a flu or, or COVID, you know, I can still be at work, I can still be on my laptop and still make a contribution. And, and turnover, depending on the industry, has gone way down because people have the flexibility. Let's go to the next slide but it's not been perfect. Obviously in-person is fantastic and it's really important to see people. You know, relationships can erode by 50% and that's a, that's a big topic. If you're not in the office, you may not be promoted. You may not be relevant and engaged with other folks. And during the pandemic, specific populations were affected and it's been well documented about women um, have been left feeling exhausted. You can imagine having you know, little children at home that you have to balance or aging parents. And so the whole burned out um, opportunity really takes place, otherwise known as Blur's Day. Is it Monday, Tuesday, Saturday? What day of the week is it? Next slide. So when we look at return to office, around the globe, there's different rates at return to office. 
Uh, Avis and Young has a vitality index that you can go onto our website, can noodle around and figure out what your city is and where you are, but they're very different rates to return. When you look at the US gateway cities, and you compare January 22 compared to January of, 9, of 2020, the US gateway cities on average are down 79%, which is you know, a, a big number. The Canadian gateway cities down 81%. Where I'm sitting in Toronto right now is down 90%. And the UK is also down an average, although slightly less. The message in this story is really that all of the major cities and the downtowns have been substantially affected during the pandemic. Next slide. Within North America, um, we've actually looked at it by industry sector. No great surprise that finance, banking, flexible providers, the tech industries and media, those industries, because you can work anywhere, anytime, you know, the talented knowledge workers, you have much greater flexibility than say other industries like us in real estate, where it's often dependent of people being in the office, whether it's for facility management or transactions or whatever, similarly with household and uh, consumer products. So depending on the industry, there's different rates of return to the office overall. So really important to know the sector that you're in before making blanket statements. On to the next one. At the end of the day, workers are winning. What we've seen is the whole pandemic hiring, they call it you know, the great resignation or the hiring boom. Employees are becoming much more confident in their roles and their jobs. And at the same time, there's burnout. So people are looking for a total value in their employee relationship as they move forward. Next slide. So at the end of the day, workplace is changing. It's a new ecosystem, disruption is taking place and everybody has to sort through what is the solution for your organization or enterprise. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Anna Scali, who will talk a little bit more about components of workplace. Thanks, Sheila. Next slide. There is no denying that the pandemic has impacted how occupiers and investors have viewed the workplace, particularly when it comes to attracting employees back and making the most out of their investments. So how can a company optimise the overall workplace experience? And how can we navigate the tug of war between employer and employee with regard to in-person work, the hybrid model, remote work, or any other variation that may evolve? The starting point needs to be by taking a step back and looking at the makeup of the workforce and their nuances. Today's talent pool is made up of a dynamic variety of generation groups, working styles and personality types, all of which need to be understood to develop and create a workplace that addresses their unique needs. This is not just good for employees, it is also good for a business, driving productivity, efficiency and innovation, all while increasing employee attraction and retention and reducing the cost of employee turnover. So what are these new archetypes and what are their needs? Through our work at Davis & Young and ongoing conversations with clients and employees, we have identified three key groups, generational, personality and archetypes. The personality traits of introversion and extroversion were initially developed by the psychologist Carl Jung but it is widely recognised that this is not a black and white allocation, or as Carl himself stated, there is no such thing as a pure extrovert or introvert. Such a man would be in a lunatic asylum. However, understanding them is important in the layering and recognition of archetypes, and consequently for us in the development of workplace settings. The introvert and extrovert personality types have preferences for different levels of stimulation which influences how and where they work best. For example, someone with a stronger introverted personality tends to prefer a quieter, more private setting to work in, communicating through email and text. This is in direct contrast to an extroverted led personality who prefers to be out in the open office area, communicating through in-person conversations and phone calls. For the first time in history, five generational groups are working side by side. By engaging and supporting these multiple generations in the same workforce, 
a company can bring together the best of expertise, experience, values, and diversity of thoughts. These nuances in the way that they work and their preferences can be seen as we dive deeper into each generation. Gen Z, the youngest of the group, is currently more than one third of the world's population, although the vast majority of these are still to enter the workforce. They, they have a need for connection, preferring impulse collaboration, and as every parent of this generation will know, they're incredibly tech savvy and very quick to adapt to new technologies. Millennials are the emerging generation, and by 2026 will be 75% of the workforce. This generation thrives on visual stimulation and high paced activity with a preference for to informality and group activities driven by their thirst for technology. They are motivated by the ESG of that gender and will search out companies that reflect their values. Gen X are currently 35% of the workforce. They adapt well to mobile settings, diverse work styles and less formal group settings like to be allowed to work autonomously and not be micromanaged. Work-life balance is important to them, and so they will be looking for flexibility. Baby boomers grew up in an era of reform and believe that they can, can contribute to changes in the world. As such, they are not afraid to challenge established practices when necessary. This generation benefits from new collaborative settings, although they do prefer acoustic privacy. And finally, our oldest generation, the traditionists, many of whom are still actively engaged with their careers, and many will never embrace full, formal, full retirement. Their hard work and be grateful attitude, together with their wealth of experience, should be embraced. But their traditional style of working with a preference for collaboration being a more formal setting, such as an office or conference room, needs to be factored in. When we overlay the generation and personality types, along with the impact the pandemic has had and the amplification of the related lifestyle changes, we identify three new archetypes. The archetypes cut across generations and personality types. So whilst you might not recognize yourself in them, it is important to understand and embrace them to unlock their potential. First, we have the innovator. These tend to be introverted, but capable extroversion when required for collaboration or brainstorming. They tend to be independent and prefer to work alone as and when they feel inspired. And they can be resentful of perceived micromanagement or rigidity in workplace structures. Working remotely can recapture the time lost to commuting or being in a physical office. And it's a great option to facilitate the innovator's productivity as well as their work-life balance which is critical for this archetype to function at optimal levels. The lonely employee is our second archetype. Feeling alone ranks alongside smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity in terms of measurable negative effects on one's mental health and physical well-being. The statistic on the loneliness epidemic, especially among young people, millennials, and Gen Z, were disturbing before the pandemic and grew worse during the subsequent quarantines. A dynamic, engaging hub that is activated with programming can not only attract these lonely workers, but measurably improve their outlook, provide them with a sense of connection and enhance their productivity. The disengaged employee. Human Resource Group found that only 36% of employees are actively engaged in the workplace, which means that some 64% of employees are disengaged. Disengaged employees will show, usually show up to work and contribute to the minimum required. They're also on the lookout for better employment opportunities. This group, though, is full of insightful, valuable employees with unrealized and untapped potential. A workplace of choice with a variety of options for working remotely and in the office can enable the previously engaged employee to re-engage in ways that work for them. This human-centric approach to the workplace can make all the difference to both the bottom line and the employee experience, but it is not a one-size-fits-all solution. What a business does, and indeed what each team does, how they work and what they're made of, up of, 
influences the dial as to how much and what type of different work settings are included in an organization's workplace. So I'm now gonna hand you over to Rick to talk through the next steps of the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, I appreciate that. And uh, excited to share with you, um, sort of as we talk with owners, as we talk with occupiers, they always ask the question, you know, that all sounds great. We understand the data, we understand sort of the analytics around it, but, but how do we actually implement this? How do we actually implement the return to the office? How do we actually implement what our new normal or what many refer to as a post COVID workplace environment is? And so what, we'll sh what I'll share with you today is a few of the um, lessons we've learned and a few of the insights that we gained. And it really starts here with the methodology. You know, when we think about where companies were, where investors were two years ago, we're in a very different spot as Sheila talked about. And so many of them start with their business. Where are they today, two years after the pandemic has started? And as they think about the next three, five, seven, 10 years, how does that strategy of their company evolve? How does the business change? How are the operations functioning today and how do they had to have adapted um, as they move forward? The second large element is all about people. And what you've heard today is that the employee experience is a really big thing in today's world. Many of us have been at home for the last two years or so, as you saw with Sheila's data. And so being able to return back to the office, being able to understand the personal experiences of employees is a very, very important aspect of creating the new work environment as you move forward. So understanding the talent of the employees, understanding your culture, how's that evolved? When you've hired people over the last couple of years, how have you integrated them into your companies? Understanding the work styles, everybody's heard of the different hybrid work styles, the remote, the in-person, and the variations off of that. But it truly is fundamental to designing the new work environment. Technology has significantly advanced and increased um, with the companies and the clients that we've talked to. While real estate spend may have reduced, technology has increased. How do you engage with employees, both in a virtual and physical environment? How do you as CRE and FM professionals manage the movement of people throughout the space? How do you make sure that you can make informed decisions through business intelligence and data analytics? So technology is a very, very important part of designing the new work environment. And then once you understand those, then you can think about the, the places and spaces, your portfolio, the individual locations, how do you integrate flexible office solutions? And so all of these elements come together. It's comprehensive, it's complex, but these share a little bit of the insights that we've gained. Next slide. And so as we think about you know, this unique work environment that we're creating, really, again, reinforcing that understanding the individuals, their experience as they work each day, as they engage with their families, their personal environments really does allow you to um, design that work environment to future proof it, to make sure it's flexible and adaptable as you think about the return to the office, as you think about sort of the new work um, environment as you move forward. Next slide. And so as companies have thought about and owners have thought about their individual locations, you know, pre-COVID and the traditional hair headquarters where people would get in their cars, they do public transportation, they'd ride their bikes, they were generally going to one geographical primary location. And as we've learned over the last two years, everybody's been fully distributed. And so how do you then sort of think about what is the right singular solution for a work environment, but then what is the right solution for all of your environments? As we think about pre-COVID, we think about the rigid hierarchy that many work environments are designed for today in this one-to-one -one relationship, we're seeing a lot more movement to this hybrid, agile, flexible, scalable campus and environments to support the people that they're working through. Go ahead, Britt. And so these are some imagery of that we're seeing again with, with companies and clients as they think through what do these work environments look like. And you'll see this focus again on making sure they're providing the right individual spaces to be productive, 
they're providing the right mix of collaboration spaces, both open and um, enclosed, as well as providing the right social environments. Because many people, because they've been isolated for two years, really are craving social interaction. And so these are some great images, just seeing how the work environment is adapting. Next slide. And so as we think about sort of, again, holistically, you know, what does the work environment need to consider? What does it need to integrate as they move forward? It certainly needs to be innovated. It needs to enhance employee pro productivity. It needs to really drive employees from their homes into the work environment. It needs to be flexible. It needs to have a choice of where to work when you go into the office environment. Everybody was used to going into the offices into their workstations now they want to be able to have flexibility and choice in terms of where they work how they meet with their team there's no question that esg health wellness and sustainability has really accelerated again over the last couple of years um, and making sure that the environments really are supportive of the employees and then technology as i talked about before and perhaps the most important piece is diversity and inclusion because employees have been isolated. Um, it's important that they provide the right inclusion and that we're embracing all the differences among employees. Next slide. And with that, I'll hand off. Go. Cool. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Anna. Well, well clearly uh, a lot of things for, for occupiers and investors to be thinking about there. Um, so let's have a quick look about at, at how we see that currently playing out in terms of, of current market dynamics. Perhaps start with a bit of context. If you remember back two years ago, um, all the discussion was about what kind of recovery we're going to have. Was it going to be long and slow? Was it going to be V-shaped? Well, I think that debate's been settled. We, we very definitely are seeing a V-shaped recovery in terms of GDP, economic activity, and particularly in, in terms of employment different policies in different countries around the world but a pretty strong recovery um, and i think one of the really positive things that we're seeing if you look at how businesses are thinking right now and how cfos are thinking we've got businesses really looking to invest to grow into uh, what may be still a bit of a bumpy ride ahead but i think generally the expectation that we've got a growing and expanding economy companies looking to invest and grow as the economy expands going forward and normally, of course, uh, we would say that that suggests uh, healthy demand for and, 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 to, and take up of office space. But of course, these aren't normal times. So let's have a quick look at what's happening in the leasing markets. Well, if we start with vacancy, uh, here you've got the, the major US cities on the left, the major Canadian cities on the right. Pretty similar pattern, uh, what we've seen is vacancy rising over each of the last two years. A lot of talk about sublease space, and in some areas, indeed, that's an important part of the market. It can influence rents. But actually, the majority of the increase of the space that we're seeing is, is coming direct from landlords. It's been handed back to landlords, or it's come out of the development pipeline um, during the course of the last two years. So if we look at what's been happening to leasing activity, uh, well, you know, it's, it's not to say that nothing's been happening. Uh, during the course of the last couple of years, we've seen leasing activity uh, certainly much lower. If we could just move the slide on, please, Britt. Uh, leasing activity uh, has certainly been uh, lower in the US cities on the left. You can see uh, a recovery during 2021, but, but leasing volume still significantly down on what we were seeing pre-pandemic, which reflects the fact that you know, in many cases, companies still not entirely sure what their approach should be and how many people they're going to have back in the office. That said, it does vary from place to place. Over in the UK, uh, this is central London leasing data. Uh, and in fact, the pattern's pretty indicative of what we've been seeing across most of the, the UK cities. You can see that recovery in leasing activity in the rising bars on the right hand side, quarter by quarter, to the extent that in the fourth quarter, leasing volumes were actually significantly above the 10-year average. Uh, and, and that's pulling down that vacancy rate in the market shown by, by the line. Uh, so the market starting to tighten again. But, but generally, you'd expect this to look pretty much like a, a tenant's market, certainly a tenant-friendly market. And if we look in North America about how that's playing out 
in terms of net absorption, the overall change in amount of occupied space, you can see that's pretty much the case. Uh, the orange bars there um, showing that uh, overall tenants have been releasing more space than they've been absorbing out of the market. And uh, that's, that's generally true across most markets. Although on a year on year basis, that's the case. What we have shown over on the right hand side uh, is the Q4 number for Canada. A lot of this driven by uh, companies in, in Toronto, particularly tech companies, where we've seen them taking a lot of space. And in the fourth quarter, net absorption did actually turn positive uh, in Canada. So some signs that we are seeing activity certainly coming back to the market. That's certainly the case in London, where we've seen a resurgence in, in bigger deals and strategic headquarter type, type activity. The lines here show uh, quoting average quoting rents, asking rents. Uh, which is the average of the rent that is the rent of the space that's available on the market. See over in the US, uh, that, that has dipped down. Uh, rents have softened a bit, but nowhere near as much as we saw in the financial crisis 10 years ago. And indeed in, in Canada, we haven't really seen asking rents come down at all. That's a bit misleading because what it actually reflects is the amount of quality space that's come onto the market and is currently uh, available, which has held up those asking rents. But it is true that generally landlords remain pretty confident that the market is going to come back. Uh, they've been holding asking rents uh, fairly stable, but where we have seen movement is on leasing incentives. And if we turn to look at that in a bit more detail, again, this is the averages across the US gateway cities and the major Canadian cities. In each case, the line shows the sort of cash uh, bit out and other tenants and allowances uh, that landlords have been willing to grant. These are uh, average rates. This is, this is data from uh, Avant, our proprietary uh, database and analytics platform that allows you to look at uh, right down to granular submarket level or aggregated up across the continent data in sort of real time about different aspects of the market. And if you're interested in following up on that, please do get in touch with us. What you can see is that the average tenant incentive shown by the line uh, have generally been trending upwards, very clear in the US, a bit more volatile in, North America, in, in Canada, but still trending upwards. Uh, and consistently across all markets, the number of months of rent free that landlords have been willing to grant has been trending upwards. So I think we can very much say that um, you know, still quite a lot of uncertainty in the market, still uh, a market in which tenants hold quite a lot of power and quite a lot of sway. So let's have a look at how is this playing out from an investment perspective. Uh, here, the dark line on the top is the total US investment transaction volume for commercial sectors. And what you can see is that after that very sharp, again, far sharper downturn um, than we saw during the financial crisis, we've seen a bumpy but generally pretty steady recovery uh, to the point where volumes are now pretty much back to uh, around where they were um, pre-COVID. The line at the bottom is the office sector. And whilst that has also seen a recovery, actually it's been more hesitant uh, and, and less complete uh, than in, is the case across the market as a whole. Again, potentially reflecting a bit of investor uncertainty about the outlook for the sector. And we can look at that in a bit more detail if we dig in uh, and just, just separate out two different components of the office market. The blue line at the top is volumes in suburban offices. <clears throat> the orange line at the bottom is CBD offices. Now here what we've done is we've just stripped out a lot of the seasonality that you get in the data because the market is very seasonal. Um, and we, we've also, um, what we've done is, is portrayed this relative to the five year average for that time of year uh, in the five years leading up to uh, the start of the pandemic. And what you can see here very clearly is that the recovery in suburban volumes has been much stronger and sharper, uh, actually exceeding pre-COVID levels on a relative basis uh, and just dropping back to that average at the end of the year. It, the CBD market, far less of a recovery. I think that reflects two things. Firstly, investors being more confident that because of distributed nature of employment, people wanting to work from home, potentially wanting to, you know, to, to have more drop in office space, potentially the suburban office market demand might come back quicker. Secondly, investors wanting to hold on to those top quality offices uh, in prime CBD locations, not wanting to put those on the market 
uh, and, and little demand for secondary CBDRs. <clears throat> so, one of the things that we think that is really common to both what occupiers are looking for and what investors are seeing and looking for at the moment is quality. And right now, I think quality has got two key dimensions uh, at the building level. The first is flexibility. The second is sustainability. In terms of flexibility, uh, that's actually got two components. First, um, uh, flexible physical layouts, the ability to adapt different uses, provide different environments, reconfigure office space as it's needed, is actually a premium for both occupiers and for uh, asset owners. Secondly, flexibility in terms of the flex sector, because flex solutions are increasingly going to be an important part of the workplace strategy that we see occupiers taking on. And so if we have a look at what we mean by that, um, here you can see some data uh, around the, the flex sector. This is in, in DC. Um, the flex sector obviously had a pretty hard downturn because uh, occupiers were able to hand back space uh, pretty quickly when, uh, when they no longer needed it. And so the sector has seen quite a lot of consolidation, a lot of occupiers under pressure. But as you can see from the chart on the right in, in DC, and this is something we're seeing in other markets, Actually, the amount of space available, the amount that they're, that they're absorbing to the market has gone up, the space coming back to the market. Operators that failed, in, often being taken over by their competitors, particularly, again, in those non-core, non-CBD locations, which are seen as being uh, an area where the market's going to recover quite quickly. Uh, we are seeing demand for flex space now recovering quite strongly. In some cases, occupiers having to wait until they can dispose of their conventional space before they can shift into more of a flex strategy. In other cases, that's already happening. Desk rates starting to rise. They've gone up by 20% or so in the second half of the year in LA, for example. And that consolidation in the sector still playing out. So flex, definitely a big part of the picture and one to watch. Secondly, sustainability. Uh, Decarbonisation is, is a huge issue. Uh, it's something that we've researched and published on quite extensively. If you go to our website, there's a significant section where uh, we go through uh, what we see as 10 key areas where the decarbonisation debate is playing out in real estate. It affects urban authorities, it affects uh, occupiers, it affects landlords in equal measure, and there's lots of content in there um, talking about how we see that playing out. But green credentials, high quality buildings that, that are environmentally sustainable uh, are definitely very much at a premium. And so perhaps I'll close with a quote from Larry Fink from his recently published letter to shareholders, that letter to chief executives that you may have seen, where he says that you know, no relationship has been changed more by the pandemic than the one between employers and employees. And he highlights that whether we're talking about you know, attitudes to flexibility and flexible working, or attitudes to climate change, decarbonisation and the impact that that has. Companies not adjusting to this new reality and responding to what their workers are telling them do so at their own perils. So really looking forward to hearing what our panellists on, on both sides of that equation think about this. So with that, Sheila, back to you. Thanks so much, Nick. That was, uh, that was fantastic from everybody. There were a couple of questions about, you know, can we get our hands on this? After the uh, presentations in this whole webinar, we will be sending um, an email to everybody with links to our website for the Vitality Index and X Factor and all the rest. It's now my pleasure to introduce a rock star panel that we've assembled today from around the globe to address both occupier and investor perspectives for this workplace. I've already mentioned uh, Tony from Infrastructure Ontario, Jonathan from Ivanhoe, Cambridge, Richard from Cisco, and Rosalie from Endeavour. So if all the panelists would show their faces, then we can uh, get rid of these slides and actually get into the conversation overall. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to start the question. And Tony, I'll, I'll go to you first of all. I've asked everybody to level set, you know, what's your world like today? What's happening in your world? And Tony, you run, you're responsible for the largest portfolios in Canada. What is it? Like 
583 million square feet, which is huge. And so you've got many moving parts. Maybe you could talk to us about what it's been like during the pandemic and what you're, what you're facing every day today. Well, sure. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be a part of this uh, group. Uh, I'm currently at Infrastructure Ontario, which is a public sector real estate uh, integrated company. And for, for an, all of us on the panel, we're, we're coming at it in a different uh, perspective. And I think the perspective from what I've seen is both the occupier and uh, the owner mixed in with the policymaker. So what the, what the earlier sessions were kind of describing is this new world order that has created a new world order for our economy has in fact been created because of, of two things, a health issue and a policy issue. And so those that are in our buildings uh, do both of those. We've got knowledge workers in our office complexes. We have those, the justice system in our courthouses. We've got um, uh, those that are working on helping our uh, citizens from a healthcare perspective, both in the offices in and around hospitals, long-term care and the like. So what I've seen over the last couple of years has been uh, a marriage or an, an unprecedented ability for those three pillars to try and uh, work together. I think over the years, there's been various ways that you know the office community or the real estate community within the occupier uh, world would would spend their time, would look at what the designs that they were needing, would look at areas. There was also a siloed way of, of how owners investors looked at their uh, investments and put capital in in the way that they needed to. And then there was a, a disparate way of how policymakers actually looked at the supply and the demand and the economy of it. So for me, Sheila, like the last uh, couple of years being uh, having having a seat uh, at Infrastructure Ontario, which has actually been seeing the bridge between these three pillars and through these three sectors has been very, uh, very enlightening. Um, and I think as we get into the panel conversation, we'll talk a lot about just how that's affected uh, various individuals. Uh, but just for level setting, we at IO have about uh, 20 to 25 million square feet of office within Ontario. So if we spend the office portion directly, but when you think about the type of work that's done by knowledge workers, add on the courthouses in there and add on all of the adjunct offices, uh, there's probably closer to 35, 40 million square feet um, in the type of office work that's gonna be needed for the future. Thanks, Tony, that's, uh, you know, really complex what you're managing every day. I'm gonna turn over to Jonathan. And Jonathan, you're in like the coolest new building downtown Toronto. So you have to tell us about that along with, you know, what you're facing across North America on a daily basis from an investor and asset manager perspective. Sure. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. Um, so some of the things that we, uh, we think about, I'll talk about this one as well, um, a, a little bit, um, you know, I, I'm obviously responsible for the leasing and development and really what the pandemic has sort of, um, uh, really allowed us to do quite frankly, is take time to sort of really rethink our offer. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years, um, meeting, um, with our various customers um tenants uh, partners uh and others um really sort of understanding sort of where they feel that the puck is heading for them where our big occupiers what they're sort of seeing and really trying to sort of pivot our offer um and then obviously sort of seeing what we're seeing in the field um in terms of intelligence coming back to us because obviously we own a, a wide variety of uh buildings uh, around the globe from new construction like the building i'm sat in uh, to what I would call sort of more older and well-loved offices. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've really seen is that there's been a huge bifurcation in demand and some of the stuff that uh, Rick was talking about uh, in his presentation a few minutes ago uh, really resonated because uh, I wonder how different those data, set, those data sets would look if you really sort of focused in on new construction. So we've sort of taken the time in the pandemic to sort of really you know, rethink our offering. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. 
um, but also try and sort of level set our portfolio and reposition it. So, you know, sort of high level objectives of what we're trying to do is, um, you know, focus more on uh, newer buildings, new construction, um, evaluate the markets that we're in, uh, determine which buildings are capable of being repositioning and will have a relevant future um, and uh, parting ways with the, uh, the unloved ones. Um, in terms of uh, where I am now, I mean, this is uh, CIBC Square Phase 1, uh, and it's a great example, I think, to a lot of the stuff I just said. It's the first tower in 3 million square feet. Um, it's fully leased. Uh, and we have a second tower, a, a sister tower, um, that is a big hole uh, behind me uh, that we'll be delivering in 2025 that right now is 43% pre-let. Um, but we have a tremendous amount of activity. So what we're seeing with our new devs from Mexico City in the south uh, up to Toronto in the north is overwhelming demand, uh, pretty much without exception for our new offices. And in some of the other markets, um, what we're seeing is, you know, it's, it's very much dependent on the nuances of the market uh, and, and the knowledge worker. So uh, leave it there. And then in terms of um, just... Uh, what we're rethinking in our offer, we'll talk a bit about it later, but we've been going deep into, you know, flexibility, uh, partners with flex operators, um, really sort of rethinking how we transact with our tenants um, and uh, really just trying to sort of make sure that we are delivering uh, the product that they're looking for. That's great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Now, Rosalie, you like what you do is very cool because you're around the globe. So you see very much differences, whether you're in Europe or North America, or Asia, maybe you could talk a little bit. And of course, you're in the media and entertainment world, which is a whole other world. Um, so maybe you could share with us a little bit about what you're seeing globally. Sure. So obviously, like everyone else, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been hit hard. We were hit hard very uh, quickly and very early on by the pandemic. We uh, um, uh, most of our uh, Client facing business are event managing events and running events, large events, sporting events, music events. Um, and so that was pretty much went off a cliff at, at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, in order to get it back quickly, there were lots of protocols we had to put in place. And as I'm sure uh, some who keep up with uh, the world of mixed martial arts know, UFC is one of our is one of our companies and we have managed to be able to keep them up and running as um, as we did our production company uh, based out of London. Um, but we've had challenges really um, with information flow, with understanding regulations and, and discrepancies and differences between what's happened in Asia, what's happened in Europe, what's happened here in the US. And in the US in particular, what is happening different from state to state. So it has been a, um, an enormous amount of work and uplift for our HR groups, our IT groups, our facilities groups, which are under my umbrella, um, to really keep up with what is going on and pivot on the fly very quickly to ensure that where we have to regulate and mandate, we're doing that, we're enforcing it uh, with very little staff, with very little um, time to really move through what the changes are and how quickly they're coming. And so that's that for us um, on the facilities and real estate team, which is all of my purview, has really been the most challenging um, aspects of what we've been uh, faced with over the last two years. You know, put aside the fact that we closed offices and they were closed for many, many months, um, our corporate culture is very much collaborative. And so getting in and getting back to the offices was extremely important for our senior leadership team. And so as a result, we had to very um, intensely focus on what that meant and how we implemented to ensure the safety of our, our employees, the safety of the events we run, the safety of the people around us. Um, and it's been difficult. You know, we, we have um, an extremely um, deep client-facing business. And so it's, it's been very tough for us. And 
I think the pivoting has really taught us to be far more flexible in our ideology of how we manage our facilities, in how we manage our real estate, um, and, and listen more closely and intently to what our business groups are saying are their challenges as well with this whole new uh, work environment. Um, like everyone, I'm sure, our industry has not been immune to the um, amount of people who have left, the turnover, the, um, the difficulty in hiring more staff now that we are back on the upswing um, and things are starting to take place again as everyone has experienced, live events are happening, um, you know, music's back and, um, you know, all of those things, sporting events, all of those things that we touch in one way or another through our business lines have, have started to really come back. And, and in some cases, it's stronger now than it was pre-pandemic. So um, it's, it's been a big ramp up for us and, and understanding the differences in the various regions of the world has been our biggest challenge and responding to that. Um, you know, we have many offices that are, that are still closed and are not reopened yet and have been closed for, you know, 18 months now. So we, um, the good news is that we're on the upswing. And so um, we've opened and closed and opened and closed now three or four different times. Our New York offices, our LA offices, our London offices, and we've also had offices that have been closed all this time. And so now we are preparing for everyone to be back in office. The UK has lightened its restrictions as of today. Um, so we will see our employees start to come back on a voluntary basis in the UK as of Monday. Um, we are also reopening our US offices as of Monday. Um, and that's all going to be strictly voluntary for the next few weeks until um, you know, things are a little bit better. And then we've, we've got the whole company report back into office, um, starting sometime mid to late February, but, um, you know, it's been challenging, certainly. Thank you so much for that. So Richard, another sector technology world, big technology giant. Um, so you have to tell us about that and how you're facing that. And then you have like a really cool title, like global head of PMO. You have to tell us what's in the PMO and what you, and, and how you're navigating all of these uh, times during the pandemic. Sure, Sheila. Yeah, I can do that. Um, first, Ro Rosalie. Hi, everybody. It's really great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Rosalie, I can massively re relate to what you're saying. My wife is a Taekwondo instructor. <laughs> so this has just been hard for her video, doing stuff by video. It's been really hard. Um, sure. So it was really interesting when COVID hit. So Cisco, at the world went remote, as we all know. Cisco sell collaboration technology. That's one of our big products. So first off, we've got to deal with all of our customers and make sure that hospitals and governments have got all of this video. You know, they all wanted it. Honestly, within two days, everybody wanted every bit of kit we got anywhere in the world, which was just really interesting. So we're dealing with that. And in the middle of that, we've got 85,000 people in 18 million square feet worldwide that have also got to go remote. So we're dealing with customers and we're dealing with our own staff. So in, in a week, we had 85,000 people that moved majority from an office environment to completely 100% remote, which was just amazing while juggling all these hospitals and sending stuff, you know, to, so that the various presidents and prime ministers could talk to each other and figure out what was going on. So that was a pretty frenetic period of time. Um, quite successful, worked really well. I lived in Asia for a number of years. And I think one of the things that was really interesting for me, I was in Hong Kong when SARS, for those that remember SARS a few years ago, when that hit. And Asia was, was sort of almost ready for this. It was bizarre. You know, they had the face masks. They had all of the protocols around cleaning surfaces. They, helped, they were really on the ball. So our Singapore and Hong Kong offices we're straight into this really interesting and and you know the rest of us all sort of like struggled to keep up with that which was which was fantastic um one of the things that we've learned through this two-year period was and honestly it was it was seeing seeing some of the data absolutely supports the stuff that we're seeing within cisco 
So more than 70% of our Cisco staff say they're not interested in coming back into the office more than one day a week when we come back. And we're looking to come back at the moment sometime in March. Some, some locations have gone back. There are cultural aspects with that. Singapore, Hong Kong, I lived a night come and what my flat was in Hong Kong, 200 square feet. It's not much fun working for two years in 200 square feet. So there's nuances, different locations, but it's really interesting that so many of our staff are really happy long term to work remotely. Um, and that's been interesting. So we've always had this policy within Cisco that anybody can work from anywhere because of our video collaboration stuff. What is now our competitive advantage? How do we, to this, this great resignation, how do we deal with that? How do we respond to that? Because um, working anywhere won't work anymore. We've all got to think about, well, okay, what else can we do to attract the talent that we need? You know, and the, there's, there's the people in Cisco that are younger and much smarter than me are the people that we wanna, we wanna bring in. So how do we grab them? So we've got to think differently. So with everybody working remote, one of the, and I worked for Sun Microsystems a, a number of years ago. And I think one of the things that that suffered with in those early days, everybody could work remote, but nobody had any identity with the company. It was really hard for you to say, ah, oh, yeah, I'm part of Sun or I'm part of Cisco. So one of the things we've tried to address is how, with everybody moving remote almost all the time, how do we get people to identify with the company and get excited about the company and that, woo -hoo -hoo, I work for Cisco sort of stuff. Um, so we're moving our portfolio to what we're calling collaboration hubs, which are specifically designed prime space, largely downtown, really high investment in the fit out of those spaces to make those the most amazing space that anybody's ever worked in. We're not looking, somebody uses, and it's, I think it was our, 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 our head of people said, we're not going to, we're no longer going to commute to compute. So the whole idea with Cisco is if you're working, stay at home. If you want to come and meet people and collaborate, come into the office, we'd love you to do that. So that's where we're driving our portfolio. So we're building these collaboration centers, which give you that, you know, you've got HR teams there, you've got IT teams there that give you all that support. The idea is that business groups will have it, maybe every quarter we'll have an event there and we'll have, I don't know, Coldplay playing in one of the centers so that people can come in and see Coldplay play and have a, have a week's conference, all of that sort of stuff. We're trying to just invigorate that. The other thing we've done during this pandemic is work really closely with our people and communities team because the, the HR, again, the, the great resignation is really, how do we deal with that? And property is only one element of that. So how do we do that? So we are looking at moving towards, we're trialing a four day working week. So if you wanna work four days a week, come and work for Cisco is you know, the message because you've got to think differently about, it's not just the spaces, the wow spaces that will make this, it's what else you need to do in working with our people and communities. So mm -hmm. Sheila, for me and PMO, I sort of deal with all of that. We're calling this hi uh, our, 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 a hybrid world. Um, and we, we have this program called Site Modernization, which is changing our portfolio from where we were pre-pandemic pre, pre to these collaboration hubs and a limited number of smaller offices, I'm driving that globally. So that fancy title should probably say dealing with hybrid or dealing so with- So cool, so cool. So you've actually started the next part of our conversation, which I'm really excited about because from an occupier's perspective, you said we're moving toward these collaboration hubs, which I think many are adopting that at different paces around the globe. So what does a collaboration hub look like? And then the more logistical question is, how do you manage your people? Who comes in on what days of the week? And how do you know when one group comes in versus the other group? And how do you not have chaos? How, so, so it teaches you to be a better leader. How, how do you actually make that work? Yeah, I mean, it is a big challenge. We're putting technology around a lot of that so people can book functions they will know what what events are going on in the space they'll know what other groups are going to be there so they can pick and choose times that they want to go into these spaces um it, it's a challenge the spaces have they're largely collaboration type environments so they're they're open sort of if i if i say like the we work reception type spaces where you walk in and you get that buzz there's a bunch of those 
we have these things called Meet Me at the Wall, which is a big video wall, which shows you stuff that's going on around the world in Cisco. So, you know, you can see what else is going on to get people excited about that. As I say, we have, I mean, even for a tech firm, I'm, 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 I should not be working for a tech firm. I'm so such a technophobe. Setting up your laptop, if you want to go in, there's experts in there that will make that a pleasant experience. Um, HR, if you've got questions, you know, especially if you're, you know, early in career or a new recruit to Cisco, an HR team that will answer those. I'm so, how do I, how do I fill in my timesheet? Not we do timesheets, you know, whatever it is we have to do. How do I do that? And you've got, you've got an HR person, people in community person that's there that can help you with those problems. Um, and then there are breakout uh, rooms where different individual groups, if you want to have your group of 30 or 40 people, you can go and have workshops. There are, as I say, there's super cool restaurant facilities and all that sort of stuff, um, just to try and make the whole, you know, you, you want it to be a space where people, oh, I remember going there three months ago, I want to go back, when's our next trip type of thing. And then I want to go home and do that non-commute to commute, so I'll work from home. Does that make and sense? For sure. So if I want to be in the office every day, you still give me that option, I can go nine to five or whatever I want if, if I want to do that because maybe um, I live in Hong Kong or somewhere else and I want to get out of my house. Uh, yeah, and abs you're absolutely right. It does vary from location to location. So we are providing that. But I think what's been really interesting, even in locations like Singapore, Hong Kong, we are seeing people maybe getting used to working in a 200 square foot apartment, bizarrely. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I, I could have stood it, but we're seeing even those sort of people saying, yeah, I wouldn't mind, even if it's like a couple of days a week working from home, we're seeing more of that than we were before. Um, there are options, we're not, we're going completely flex, so there's not going to be any assigned seating. You need to book your workstation, but yeah, you can come in and work if you really want to, but we're trying to put people off doing that. So Tony, I got to yeah. ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a public sector, like like OMG, like that's exactly opposite what people envision for the public sector. What I, and I know you're advancing in your portfolio. Maybe you could share with us your journey and how it relates to what Richard said, because you've got a great collaboration areas too. Help. Yeah. So I, I I think it's it's interesting what has the, the, the current data that is occurring around the world, and Richard, just even in your conversation, if people are getting used to working in their 200 square feet, let me tell you, we, we just did a, um, a survey now, IO is a microcosm, I would say, of, of Ontario, Ontarians, and certainly public and private sector. And, and on all variables from two years ago, it went up, except for the one variable that spoke to what you just said, people will want to work in their 200 square foot. That wasn't it. So productivity was up, yes. People were feeling more engaged. They were feeling very included because all of a sudden the technology allows you now to do town halls and you can be coming right into somebody's living room. We're seeing everybody's living room. We know that we know the name of people's cats and dogs and, and we're seeing their babies being burped. Like all of this is now occurring and it's occurring in a sector public sector is more policy and knowledge workers, you know, so it's kind of been a, occurring in a sector that traditionally has not been as transparent, perhaps, as many other sectors, even though they wish to have been transparent. What we're finding, we have um, undergone a, re a huge renovation of what I would call the hub of of, uh, of government. So McDonald Block in Toronto is, uh, is in the downtown. It is being renovated. You know, uh, it was funny, Jonathan, when you were talking about some of your loved portfolio, we actually call the public sector real estate the loved portfolio because it's large, it's old, it's valuable, it's expensive, and it's kind of diverse. And it's loved because, you know what, 50 years ago, there was a huge infrastructure boom on these kinds of facilities. Guess what, 50 years later, with capital not have been put into place, with the with the ability to not be uh, not have uh, those loved elements kind of upgraded, you know the amount of capital that needs to be spent and the infrastructure dollars that need to be spent, that's a huge debate and opportunity now, and we're seeing it transform in in projects like McDonald Block, uh, you know five different buildings, large square footage. Uh, where we started from a business case perspective was unassigned seating for sure, but what we actually started with was a one to three ratio, you know, and now we're into 
What does hybrid space actually look like? How can we utilize it to collaborate? What is full unassigned? How do we actually, you know, Richard, you made me laugh when you talked about your own employees were trying to figure out how to use technology at home while trying to get prime ministers, premiers, uh, hospitals, CEOs, and everybody else working, I would say the same for the public sector. You know, they, on a dime, uh, the individuals uh, went to their homes, uh, but at the same time, we've learned a ton. We've learned a ton because we were in the middle of a renovation. We were in the start of uh, recreating something that was a 50-year-old iconic uh, landmark upgrading it to what needs to be done, had some thoughts, you know, four or five years ago when you first design it, and have now been able to pivot. I think critically important to this next wave, and Jonathan, you kind of touched on it, is how do you reimagine your space so that you deal with the health and safety aspects that people are very concerned about, the social distancing uh, protocols, the mechanical systems, the, the, the wayfinding, how you move around in the space, the elevators, you know, it's all these kind of mundane, non-sexy type stuff of the buildings that are now being brought front and center. It's not the sexy amenities that created the culture. You know, it's not the ability to do stuff. It is the mundane, how do I get to work? What's the infrastructure on the transportation for me to get there? What's the fear factor for people now? You know, everyone is with this last variant, everybody was like ready to come in. Most people were back into the office, uh, frankly, in our public sector area on a hybrid model um, and, and then back, back at home. So this back and forth for individuals has really caused, I think, a rethinking of space, a rethinking of how we uh, uh, work with our space, the culture, but but make no mistake, you know, there is uh, all the data that I, I think Rick was talking about there, that to me was reinforced. We're seeing it uh, across the public sector, but make no mistake, people are not happy being in 200 square feet working. Uh, that is frankly the lowest in like that was the indicator that came down uh, and I would say it's not sustainable the productivity um, data that uh, that we saw earlier you know that's a year two years old I, I wonder how sustainable that is in the future I think that translates to the turnover people cannot sustain that current productivity their balance is out of whack home is now everything uh, and you're working longer hours you're working uh, more complex you're working with technology and the stress level is higher so to me the the spaces and the places that we create in the next while Sheila I think are what uh, uh, are what the innovation opportunity is there's great new innovative designs there are hubs there are locations where people can drop down and go in and I think most office uh, uh, um, entities are doing that. So Rosalie, this is just now teeing you up to say, how is it fitting in your world? Are you moving to unassigned seating, hot desking, hybrid? Or are you saying I'm scaling it up in some places and going traditional in others? What does it look like for, for Endeavor? Well, I think <clears throat> it is, a, it is a, a kind of mix of requirements based, and we, we do it more so based on the business and how they operate. Some of our businesses are like shared services in the office every day, finance, IT facilities. We have to be there, right? We keep the we keep the spaces running. We have to make sure that they're safe, they're cleaned, lights are on, things are working. Um, so in fact, our facilities and IT staff have probably been the only ones who have not had any time out of the office over the two years. We've been in and we've been working. Um, I think, again, it's our philosophy, our corporate culture is very, very much collaborative and, and everybody in the office, everybody moving around, everybody con collaborating. But that's not really translated into reality for us. And so we've seen a lot of our business groups kind of take it upon themselves to manage their their operations based on what works best for them. We're seeing the same thing that Tony was saying. We see more people wanting to come in two, three days a week and still have their time at home and work from home because of home obligations that we've now all gotten used to being able to handle 
both because we're here in the house. I personally, you know, have that same experience with little kids. So for me, it's been, uh, yes, I've gone into the office, but I'm only doing it when I absolutely have to because I am just as productive at home and on my computer as I am when I'm in a face-to-face meeting. So for me, and, and a lot of people like me, we've seen that kind of a model. We are using a hot desking uh, space sharing model in many groups that are far more easily flexed. Um, our tech teams, our ops teams within the businesses themselves who can work more on a flexible schedule arrangement, different work times, having groups come in earlier and other groups come in later. And, and they're all experimenting with that amongst themselves, frankly. We're not mandating any one way of working and we don't want to because we don't feel that our particular, um, our particular set of businesses can work completely in a hybrid mode. There has to be that interaction face-to-face and collaboration. It's just how we, we operate amongst all of our different businesses and silos. So um, for us, it's, it's not been necessarily something that we've said, this is the way we're moving. It's just kind of been, let's see what works best and, and then practice that within. I guess that's the best way I can explain it. Awesome. So Jonathan, I mean, the, now the pressure's on. From a building um, operator, asset manager, and investor perspective, how do you deal with all of this? <laughs> like, how do you say somebody yeah. wants to come in, somebody doesn't? Do you care as long as they're signing their leases? Like, how, how do you actually operate the building and then future-proof your investment? Yeah. So I think for us, it's sort of, we, we have to solve this. Otherwise, somebody else is going to solve it for us. Um, so... That's sort of the way I look at it. So, I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about sort of, you know, rethinking our offering and now I'll expand on that a little bit. I mean, one of the things that we've been really laser focused on is unpacking flex Um, because what we're hearing from a lot of our customers, and I can tell you, I feel it personally, is not everyone likes to sleep at work, right? So, you know, the working from home, the flexibility, we've been sort of forced there because of the pandemic and the technology has enabled us to be productive. But every conversation, every interaction is very transactional and needs to be scheduled. And what you miss are those casual collisions of seeing people in real life. So, you know, there are some, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, chips in the, uh, you know, uh, the the veneer of uh, the panacea of working from home. Um, And I think, you know, it's sort of up to us to sort of help solve it. So what we're hearing from our occupiers is, they definitely want to move up the quality chain. Maybe they want a smaller footprint, but they definitely want it in the best project in town. So their actual sort of CRE spend may not change much. So kind of more what Richard was saying, supporting them with sort of hubs for collaboration. And the other thing too is on the flex side is we need to meet our tenants long and short and you know uh, varietal uh, space needs on an ongoing basis within a singular transactional ecosystem. Where the landlord screwed up, and I put ourselves in that category too, is we sent people with Flex 1.0, we sent our most valuable relationship, our tenants, down the street to go and transact directly with the WeWorks and the industriouses and whatever. And all those groups got very close to our tenants. So what we're doing right now, and I've just signed a strategic partnership with WeWork there, and I actually sort of tried to practice what I preach by working out of a WeWork for six months, um, is we're really sort of doing it where they are the operator, um, but it's in our space. And I transact um, with our tenants uh, on a single document. So, you know, Tony could come to me, says, I need 30,000 square feet for this user group, um, but uh, we're gonna need, you know, 100 seats uh, for the next six months. Uh, and then maybe 50 uh, th- thereafter, would be able to do that on a single deal uh, with our sort of powered by we um, product that we're rolling out. And that's really us because um, I think we need to get the flex operator focusing on what they do best, which is operating. And the landlord needs to really sort of focus on the relationship and understanding the needs of the customer and solving that. So we're spending a huge amount of time sort of on that uh, going forward. 
And then the other thing we're trying to do is remove the friction from the leasing process. Um, <clears throat> because I mean, at the end of the day, the leasing process hasn't vastly changed. There are technological tools that can support that. But just as you can rent a vacation property for a week's vacation in a couch in the middle of the night, on a couch in the middle of the night, hard to, it's harder to do that with office space. So we're trying to sort of pick the lock on that too. Uh, and working with sort of a few strategic partners to be able to sort of support that not every, um, not every, uh, I guess, tenant demand uh, person, uh, a lot of the technology tenants, they want to have that sort of direct uh, interaction and be able to sort of secure that space on a flexible basis. And then the other thing that I'm really look, focusing on, and the amenity stuff to me is table stakes, it's a given, if you don't have them, you're going to get killed, is third places. You need to create third places because you know what? People like the flexibility of being able to work from home. But, you know, I was on our investment committee call as we do every Thursday, and we were looking at a deal in the Far East this morning. And the work from home thing, despite what, you know, Richard said, what we're seeing is, you know, it's much, much harder uh, when you live in these tiny apartments to work from home, particularly when there's, when there's family involved. But the use of sort of third places, so almost like the WeWork All Access Pass, you know, could be a strategic tool uh, for a landlord to enable to sort of partner with our tenants to be able to provide that agility that maybe somebody wants to work close to the home, but not actually in it. Maybe they don't necessarily want to commute into the CBD, but they don't necessarily want to work, you know, um, at the home. So I think the other thing, too, is we focused on these structures and these mandates of part time, full time, three days a week. And I think at the end of the day, it's got to be driven by choice. Uh, there's a huge war on talent, um, and I think uh, the employer right now, sorry, the employee wields a huge amount of power. And if they don't like what their employer is offering, they're going to vote with their feet and leave. So what's right for me may not be right for the person who sits two doors down from me, and he or she may prefer uh, to spend more of their time working remotely. So it's got to be choice-based, and you need to create different spaces for activity-based work. Like if I'm on Zooms all day, I, I could theoretically sit at home and do that. But if I need to collaborate with people um, or I need to sort of go through numbers or talk to partners, it's much, much harder to do that when I'm just looking at a small little monitor uh, in my home office. So um, I, I think we, we, we like as a society to categorize people and to put them into compartments. And we're doing the same thing here. And I think the most important thing is it's not one size fits all. Uh, everybody's needs are different. Everyone's personal situations are different. And everyone's what they do. Uh, if you're an accounts payable person, maybe you can work from home more easily. But if you're selling stuff, if you're out in the field and you need to meet with customers, you know, when we pitch business, we need to do that in person. Like when we have, when we, when we hire people to represent us, I want to know the chemistry of the people that we're hiring. I don't want to see them on a box on a screen. So it's going to be very interesting to watch this play out. And right now it's been all work from home. And if you go to all work from office, that's not the answer either. But when it's hybrid, how do you create that environment that's in inclusive and doesn't make people feel like they're a second class citizens if they choose to be at home or they choose to be in the office? Like the people who choose to come in shouldn't be pariahs any more than the people who choose to stay home. I'll leave it at that. Wow. All I can say is, wow, how do you unpack all of that? So Richard, I'm going to turn to you. Before I open up for questions for the broader group, now Jonathan's just introduced the landlord-tenant relationship. And so, you know, that lease document may be something like a one-page or click like Expedia, and or what you want from a landlord is going to be very different in the future. Um, in your PMO role, maybe talk a little bit about that. I've got a, you know, a lot of real estate people on the line who are probably just dying to hear from all of our panelists around that subject. And, and I think Jonathan talked about it really well. We're definitely looking, not we're looking at different solutions for different business units. So these collaboration hubs, we're investing a lot of money at those. So they're they're these high-end prime downtown locations we're looking for longer leases on those because we want to invest a lot commit it's going to be a space we're going to be in for you know for a while um but jonathan's absolutely right we're also looking for oh we've acquired a business here or a, a particular sales opportunity is opening up there and being able to respond 
I feel sorry for landlords because it's hard to respond to all of these terrible demands that tenants like ourselves come with. But we are definitely looking for that. We want some long stuff and we want some really quick. And you, you, you're right, Jonathan, to be able to come back with here's a one page, sign it and you can be in tomorrow type of stuff. Um, and it's really interesting to hear what Jonathan said about um, you know, landlords moving into that WeWork space. I think that's, you know, that's, 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 that's quite exciting for us. Um, we, are, we are increasing the amount of those sort of flex type opportunities we're giving to our staff. Um, I, I did want to touch on one other, and I think Rick mentioned it earlier, I think, and, and Jonathan talked about it just now. How do you make sure that if you're either in the office or not in the office, you have that same consideration, the same quality of experience? So one of the things where I think we're struggling with, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out is, and we're trying to build it into these collaboration spaces, if you have a team of 50 people, if 25 of them are in that space and 25 are dialing in, how do you give them that same, and, and absolutely right, Jonathan, how do we give them that same inclus inclusivity in the discussions? Uh, you know, you, 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 I, we've probably all sat on video calls where one person has not got a word in, has just sat there quietly for the whole meeting. And how do we deal with that? And maybe there's some protocols and stuff around that. But what we are trying to do is put, systems in all of our environments that allow people to see other things that are going on in the room so we're putting other cameras so you can look and say oh i see the people are back are having coffee you know it gives you more of that inclusion in the meeting does that make sense i think you're going to be really well served as we come out of this from a cisco perspective tony i can see you're dying to uh, jump in here just, uh, just uh, I wanted to jump off of both WeWork's collaborative hubs and kind of the discussion about, you know, downtown. Just what we're starting to hear is the debate. And, and Jonathan, you said it perfectly when you said, let's not shame or blame those that, uh, that wish to uh, work in the way that they wish to work. So right now, from a, even a policy or an economic development perspective, the, the thought process is, you know, is it all downtown? Is it only in owned space? Is it only in leased? What about uh, the, the dialogue that we are really having is, you know, those collaborative spaces can be Main Street versus downtown street. You know, it's now, it's not suburban, but it is in fact community Main Street. And how do you revitalize some of those communities? Because people are working in different locations, uh, both within the city, outside the city, and on their way to vacation or on their way back from vacation. So we're spending a lot of our time and effort right now just thinking about the flexibility of the person and where are they in their stage in life? How are they can able to do what they need to do? How do we make sure that uh, we keep that attraction there? But also, where are you building from an economic development perspective? Where are you ensuring that we keep you know, community Main Street alive as well as downtown, uh, we, we, we really, you know, I love the shame and blame because there's always an, a versus, you know, downtown's bad, we need to actually get to, and suburbs are great, or, you know, down, suburbs, oh my God, you, downtown is where you need to be. It's been, it's been the history of kind of supply demand tenant uh, landlord of, of blaming and shaming different areas for competitive advantage, that's gone now. And so it's no longer a conversation about the competitive advantage of being in downtown versus suburban. It's now, where is the best place for somebody to be able to do that particular work in that particular time? And how does that in fact continue to spur our economy across, um, across the various main streets and communities, suburban, downtown? So that's kind of, to me, I think it's a, it's a wonderful, I, you know, pandemic has done many things. The one thing that I actually have really seen it do is, is open up these discussions with competitors, with, uh, you know, partnerships that are there. And I'm sure, Jonathan, you've got a lot on that front. You know, I talk about this a lot. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to add, actually, Tony, about, like, you know, we talk about, you know, the workplace, but I think we also need to talk about the impact of where people work and on themselves, because I think, you know, the, the, the mental health piece, I think there's a lot of loneliness right now. Um, and people have different social needs. And some people love it because they just get to sort of be in their own space if that's what makes them most comfortable. And other people feed off the other stuff. And we need to also sort of think about the generation that's coming in behind us. Like, how do we train and mentor them 
if we only see them transactionally on a screen. Like it's you know, really hard to do. Some of the most valuable interactions are the pieces right before a meeting or right after a meeting where you sort of say, this is what we're gonna do. This is why I wanna get there. And you allow them to ask the questions. Well, I noticed you said this in that meeting. What exactly did you mean? And why did you go there? I thought you wanted to do this. And I, and, and it's, so you're, you're trying to develop the next crop of leaders. And, you know, I mean, if I've got to make an appointment to do that, that's going to be hard. Um, it's those conversations that you have with someone who's stood in your doorway, right? Or just walks by and says, hey, you know, I wanted to speak to you about this. Yesterday was Bell Let's Talk Day. So your mental health analogy is so relevant and prevalent. Four or five years ago, it was one in six, uh, certainly uh, Canadians that were uh, relaying mental health issues. Uh, yesterday, it's now one in three. So the stats have just ballooned. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. It is leadership that actually helps that. It is the ability to talk through. And then it is a system both on a workplace, but also how we deal with society and culture um, to help our incoming leaders and our current leaders uh, work with all kinds of uh, individuals in the, in the way that they need to be um, dealt with. That is so powerful. So I'm gonna piggyback on that and talk about ESG. That's a, a whole other topic. I'll say ESG and diversity and inclusion all in one bundle. Rosalind, maybe I'll turn it to you to lead the conversation around that because I know you've got some strategies that would uh, be appropriate. So for us, I mean, we've um, we've tried to look at our workforce and understand people's desires of what they want within their work environments. Um, the diversity and inclusion comes in by uh, us designing our spaces. And I'm not talking about this on an employee, an employee hiring perspective. That's, that's different. But for us, creating more diversity for inclusion um, in the different types of environments we provide very similar to what Richard was saying about creating these hubs for collaboration. Our design model has been extremely focused on a one-to-one -one desk or office ratio per person. Um, and obviously in a media and entertainment space, our workforce is very young. Um, and so, we put a lot of emphasis on bringing in and mentoring, as Jonathan was saying, the younger workforce to come up through the ranks as the new leaders for the company. Um, and to be able to create space and service that space and provide for the employee experience, I think has been the shift in our corporate culture that is taking place because our leaders obviously are in one level of generation and then all of the workforce is now coming up in a completely different level of generation and sometimes there's two generations between and so it's very difficult to express from my perspective some of the challenges i have are trying to bridge the gaps between and say Yes, we want to be inclusive and we want to have diversity of workspace, but um, you want it all one way and that's everybody in the office five days a week, everybody collaborating, but the workforce doesn't want it that way. And so where, you know, where do you create that middle ground? And so for me, I try to bring the, the ideas up obviously to the to the uh, the ELT and our leaders to say look this is what we're seeing this is the feedback we get this is what the desire is for people to be here four days a week or three days a week or five days a week even but we're not we're not there we're not providing that yet and so we've we try and bring diversity inclusion and equal opportunity and opportunity for growth and employment um, and bringing and being able to to attract all that talent by rethinking how we're using our spaces. And that means for us creating more collaborative spaces, creating more areas where people can congregate in a much more informal manner. And we're, we're seeing that feedback come to us 
very strongly from from our workforce as a desire to have a much more diverse way of working. And it does not need to be the traditional office and workstation type of environment. So Richard, I'm gonna to pivot to you on sustainability. And, and I'll put in ESG and DNI in that whole big bundle and let you pick on whichever topic is most important to you at this point. As the PMO leader, you've probably got to deal with all of it. So sustainability is a massive thing for us. You know, it, it's, it's, it's in the top three or four drivers at corporate level for Cisco. Um, and how we deal with that in our spaces, um, we're driving to much more um, uh, 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 environmentally sourced power for our data centers and labs and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it, it's been interesting. I think historically we've, I don't think we've, apart, apart from the collaboration centers, we've not fundamentally changed the way that we approach the fit out of our spaces. So I would say we've, we've got significant parts of our portfolio in the United States that are owned, um, but the rest of the world is predominantly leased. Uh, and the way we've approached those, I don't think has changed much, even though we've got these big, you know, we're going for lead platinum and all this sort of good stuff in, in a lot of our buildings now. Um, we, we just haven't certified it before. And I think, again, to Rosalind's point, is sort of, you know, the new early in career people, you know, the people we want to, honestly, quite frankly, make happy and excited about working for Cisco. We're doing much more in terms of certifying our spaces to say, hey, look, you are now walking into a Lee Platinum space. Um, uh, well is also really- How about net zero? How about net zero? I'm gonna throw that out because I'm looking at my friend, Nick Oxford now, and that's a part of his you know, global trends. Is, is net zero a topic for anybody on our, in our panel? 100% for Cisco. Jonathan wants to go. Jonathan, over to you. No, we, we've made a publicly uh, a public uh, objective uh, that you know to 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 for IC to be net zero by 2040. So I mean, it's absolutely of focus to us. Um, our remuneration is tied to our ESG ESG objectives. Um, I, I agree with everything Richard said. Um, I think the types of assets that we have, um, you know, this is absolutely front and center. Uh, all our new projects, I mean, you know, we have to sometimes balance what our partners want to do because typically we invest through development rather than sort of do it ourselves. And so, you know, when you have a, a GP that, you know, is looking to sort of maximize profit and earn a promote, you know, they might be happy with lead gold and it's really up to us to sort of drive it home as, no, it's lead platinum, don't care about the incremental cost. Because, you know, as a long-term strategic investor, and yeah, we recycle a lot of capital and, and, and you know, do anywhere between sort of six and eight billion dollars of the transactions a year in terms of buying and selling. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely beholden on us, um, you know, to be a leader in this. I mean, our, uh, quite frankly, a lot of our customers are very large groups like Richard. Um, and, you know, a lot of those tenants, quite frankly, they won't even look at you. Um, if you don't have a, a stated objective, if you're not a thought leader in the field and the product that you're delivering doesn't check all those boxes. And they're not just looking for certifications. They're looking for a landlord who actually sort of walks the walk, right? And so, you know, we, when you're dealing at the enterprise level, I mean, some of our big, you know, biggest customers, sort of global technology companies, um, you know, they, uh, you know that, that they view you as a partner and we view them as a partner. I mean, Tenant is a horrible feudal name from God knows when. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, we have to sort of, you know, embrace the needs of our tenants and deliver the offering that, uh, you know, the market is looking for. Terrific. I'm, I'm getting the uh, nudge now that we need to wind up our panel. So um, to, to be conscious of our last comments for everybody, what I'd like to ask you each in just like two, three quick sentences to take your Ouija board, say, think about the future in five to 10 years. What does that look like to you? And we've had a few questions in the Q&A. Will your portfolio be, if you're an occupier, larger or smaller? So Tony, I'm gonna to start with you on that one because you've got the, the big giant portfolio and big decisions. 
Um, so I'll, I'll start with your last question. Will our portfolio be larger or smaller? It will, it has continually been smaller. So from a crown perspective, you know, it, it needs to uh, be able to be nimble, to be optimized, to be reduced and, and, uh, and modernized. Um, I would say, you know, I've had the pleasure of being the chair of Real Packs, which is, uh, you know, a Canadian thing. So we've spent a fair bit of time strategically thinking about the next three to five years and brought it down to, you know, our three E's, which the economy still has to be number one. So I think the next three to five years for everybody is going to be focused on how they, they bring and recover back. The next three to five years is ESG. We started talking about it now. That was not an E people were talking about two years ago in this form. And EDI, of course, our ability to actually bring new talent into the into this industry, ensure that uh, we've got we've got the best and brightest and also the most diverse uh, thought process. But I also think the next three to five years is going to have a lot more of a fourth E that we call empathy. We've not actually had the dialogues in in society as we're having now, and people are just more empathetic. And lastly, because I know it's my last thing. Look, we're starting. I love the I love the the thing of ready, reset, go. The Olympics are next week. Go Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Ro Rosalie. I'll turn it over to you. From um, if you could give us your Ouija board for the next five to ten years. Um, I don't see us decreasing our our portfolio. I do see us continuing to grow, just based on M and A growth that we've got in the pipeline and and what we're looking to do as a company but I see us being much more strategic about it. So rather than continuing to just add to the portfolio organically, I see us being more smart about the portfolio management as well as consolidating. So potentially reducing the amount of locations we have in, in being smarter about how we're using space and consolidating so that there's um, more allowance for us to work smarter in those locations versus just multiple locations, you know, multiple offices throughout a, a city or a country. Um, and I, that's where we, you know, we make our portfolio better and smarter. Awesome. Jonathan, what do you think? What's happening in the next five to 10 years? Sure. I, I mean, I think our portfolio size in, in absolute dollars is going to grow. Uh, our exposure to office, though, is probably going to stay about the same. So therefore, it will shrink in relation to our overall portfolio. Um, what you will see, though, is that the office product that we own in five years time, uh, a lot, it's going to be vastly different. I mean, we're really sort of focusing on creative office, new office, following the people, following migration, definitely CBD focused. Uh, a lot of dev and built to core kind of projects, probably less main and main glass and steel mega projects, and more creative office and mixed use in what we call momentum cities. Uh, so US Sunbelt primarily. Thank you. And Richard, you got to bring it home from a technology company perspective. You know everything. Where's the world going in the next five to 10 years? Are we all going to be online forever? I hope so. And hopefully using Cisco technology, I'll be happy with that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, consolidate our portfolio, but to Jonathan's point, not looking to reduce our spend, we will reinvest in the portfolio that we retain and make those spaces high end and, and you know, better experience, better fits. Um, I wrote down two things, talent and inclusion. I think figuring out how we, what we can do in and again, working with PNC and in the real estate function to make sure that we're attracting the right talent to Cisco and in the right locations, as Jonathan says, and how we figure out that inclusion of with, with moving to hybrid, how do we get that balance between people in the office and people not and making sure that everybody has the good experience. It's wonderful. Listen, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to the Avis and Young speakers. Um, an amazing conversation. Talk about rapid fire from every topic you could possibly imagine. I'm sure there's some that we've forgotten about. And for all of our guests, we will send a follow-up email with some content for you so that you've got all the stats and facts and the names of our speakers and all the rest. But thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. We've truly had a great conversation. So thank you all. <laughs>